Let's start off with a really great piece of writing that exists in nature. You guys teach from 4th to 12th grade. Where are you 4th grade teachers? Anybody? Howdy do. Okay. Well, let's look at some writing how it, where and how it exists in the real world. Oh. We could start with actual headlines. Here's one. In today's, what's this? Dallas Morning News. We have superintendent has much to live up to and live down. Most challenging job comes with good and bad from predecessors. So you have a new superintendent on his way in. Is that right? Or one on his way out? Or both. I guess they both have to mutually exist. Let's do something more fun. How about this one? In thinking about what makes writing good, it's clarity and interest, isn't it? If, if a piece of writing is either confusing or boring, it's bad. Those are my two criteria for good writing. It's got to be clear, it's got to be interesting. If it's both of those, it is good writing. If it's only one of those, it's not good writing. If it's neither of those, it is recyclable. And who says what's clear and who says what's interesting? Well, that's what we call audience. Look at this. Um, actress, musician to wed. I love this piece of writing. The actress from the big, big hit movie and the musician from the popular band who've been photographed many times together out in the town are getting married. Entertainment industry sources reported Monday. I love him. The actress who's been seen sporting a huge diamond engagement ring recently told reporters while walking down the red carpet, he's definitely the one. The wedding, which will take place this summer, is expected to be attended by many equally famous celebrities and will be photographed by many paparazzi via helicopter if necessary. Insiders expect the guest list to be a veritable who's who of the rich and famous, including the Hollywood director, the reclusive former star who rarely makes public appearances, and the very handsome actor who used to be on television but is now in the movies. <laughs> Isn't that funny? So what makes that funny is headlines. It's so generic. We could take any article and turn it more generic by replacing specific people and specific descriptors, everything that's specific about it and general it up and have one just like that. Wouldn't that be fun? We could take the Dallas superintendent actual article and blur every single piece of information in it and have something hilarious. Oh, that man in charge of the big place where people go. He's going to have some highs and lows. Woo! That's a fun thing for kids to do because it gets them used to looking for specifics and thinking about generals. It's fun to go in the back door and do things backwards. Do you think really that they would think that's a good thing to make things blurry and fuzzy? Of course not. Of course not. They don't want to write like that. They, but showing them how to write often is a boring process. So if we can liven up that process and give them funny things to do, ooh, listen how bad I made this. <laughs> that is so bad. <laughs> then they can look at their own writing and know how bad it is. <laughs> I, had so, I teach this year, and I will be teaching in the next few years, at the Eleanor Kolitz Academy, which is a Jewish day school. I'm out of public schools now, unless we get the charter we've applied for, and then it will become a public school. But it's a Jewish day school, and every child there is learning a, a second language or a third language, and that language is Hebrew. They all study Hebrew and are fluent by the time they're third graders. It's a really astounding thing. Our campus goes up to the eighth grade, and at the eighth grade, springtime, the eighth graders all go to Israel for two weeks. <clears throat> so they just came back. Our class of eighth graders, there are six of them. It's a tiny school. And the, the eighth graders just came back and were asked to tell a thank you speech to the community at the school with the parents and different people coming in. So this, um, I was asked to look at their speeches, help them write good speeches. Well, that's the same thing as writing good papers. It's just they're delivered out loud. 
So they started off with a thank you and then they continued with a memory. One moment of their Israel trip that they'd like to share. And the whole speech was only supposed to be a one minute delivery, which is a great way to tell them how long does it have to be. Time yourself and watch your clock. It needs to be one minute. Can't go shorter than 40 seconds. And nobody's going to talk this slowly. You know, they'll write enough to speak for a full minute. But they were so generic. They were like this. Oh, I had an amazing time. It was so incredible. We did so many things. We'll pick one. OK. OK. One of the girls told me, I went to a chocolate factory. So that was the, her, her choice. We went to a chocolate factory, and they had us make all these different kinds of chocolate. It was so amazing. Oh, good. What's yours? I got to go to this place. And I stood up, I picked out this rock, this tall rock, and I stood up on the rock and just stood there looking at the view, and it was just amazing. <laughs> hmm, what about yours? Oh, when we celebrated Purim, which is a holiday, Purim, at the Kotel, which is um, the holy wall that's left from the holiest temple. And so they, okay, good, well, you've got at least one thing people will recognize what that is, a rock and a chocolate, okay. What about yours? Oh, this, this guide told us about her religion. It was one I never heard about. It was amazing. OK, good. And they fed us some good food. It was um, You can hear it. So they all wrote about their experiences. And sure enough, as they read their pieces, they were just little copies of what they had said out loud. It was amazing. I never, I'll never forget it. Well, these are some really accomplished, world-traveled, literate kids of symphony players. And they're just really from families where our language is rich. And they're speaking like this. So I had a little chat with them and said, you guys, you're being selfish and you're being lazy. Didn't you? It's selfish for you to say, you can't share what I have. I'm not going to share with you. Your experience is something that you're asked to share in, and you're going to either share it willingly and generously, or you're going to say, no, you had to be there. It's an end joke. We're an exclusive club, and you're not in it. Or you're going to open up your door and say, come see what I saw. Let me take you there. Let me show you what it looked like. And that's how you show them your experience. But by saying, it was amazing, that's this. I get to know what was so funny about this joke, but you don't. I just can tell you, it was hilarious. That's not nice to do to people. And it's lazy, and it, they were like, and I said, so what we're going to do instead is give them specifics. They'd all learn bada bings. Do some bada bings. Where were your feet? What were you seeing? What did you hear? Look at your handout. They know these icons. I said, activate your tools. What did you hear when you were breathing? What could you smell? You were in a place in the world that nobody else here knows what any of those things smell like. I, I've never been to Israel. I have no idea what that rock air smelled like. Did it smell like pinon? Did it smell like acrid? Did it smell like burn your nostrils up because the air was so dry? I couldn't tell you. But I'd love to know through you. So they started answering questions. They started asking themselves. And the girl who went to the rock revealed through her own questioning, where was it? It was at Masada. Do you know Masada? Way up on, there was a fort built by these Jewish people. And when she stood on this rock that was higher than most of Masada, looking down, you know what she was saying? Oh, it was amazing. It was Roman ramps where the Romans were building to come and kill all of those people. Where she looked down, she said, I saw these Roman structures, ramps. And looking out, I saw the desert. And what were you thinking about? She said, I was thinking about what it would have been like to be here when the people were watching the Romans approaching, knowing they were going to take their own lives instead of be conquered that what you were looking at was a desert thinking, this is the last thing I'm ever going to see, and it was thousands of years ago, and here it is, 2012, and I'm a 12-year-old in the same spot that those people I've studied about my entire life stood moments before they died. 
It was amazing. <laughs> now I ask you, which one would you rather hear about? Which one gives you chills? Well, they all listen to hers. And the girl who wrote about the chocolate factory talked about how when she was on the bus eating her chocolate and the bus driver took one and she resented it and she realized, I should have bought some of those white chocolate covered pretzels for my family. I didn't buy anything for my family. And there was a little bitter regret with the sweet taste in her mouth. It was a bittersweet memory, like the bittersweet chocolate. It was also amazing. Okay, well, um, I'm going to share with you the, the link to that Dropbox so you can download any one of the chapters. That's why your handout is so flimsy. There are about 200 pages ready for you to get for free that are all about expository writing activities for 13 different teaching situations. The situation right now is we're not testing right now, and we won't think about testing for a little while. We'll just think about teaching and our teaks. How's that? But these are all going to be part of it. On the front, these icons represent all kinds of text, things we hear with our ears, sound effects, things we say out loud, dialogue. Um, our feet, places we've gone. All of those are different kinds of text and if you see any that you want to know what is that, we'll talk about them. But for now, let's open it up and let's make a gritty life quick list. So I'm just going to ask you to write down some, uh, some items for this list and then we'll pick one of them and do something with it. So for numbers one and two, can you think about things in your life that you have had but you lost? Things that you've lost, items, objects that you have lost. And just jot them down. They got away from you somehow. For numbers three and four, Can you think about two people, um, can you think about two pet peeves you have with other people related to you, not related by blood, I mean in your life? Two pet peeves, things that people do that drive you a little bit crazy. You don't have to say their names. Um, think about places in your life that you have ever enjoyed hiding in, hiding places. It could be when you were a child, it could be last week. <laughs> Good hiding places. Seven and eight. Two things that you really wish someone else would just go ahead and buy for you. <laughs> Two things you wish someone would buy for you. Nine and ten. Two things you do not, absolutely not, plan to eat for lunch today. Two things you will not be eating for lunch. And 11 and 12, two rules you used to have to follow, but you don't have to follow those rules anymore. Two rules you're glad you don't have to follow nowadays. We're done. That's our tough academic work so far for the day. Did you enjoy making that list? I did. I asked y'all some things I never really thought about. What would you do now with a list like that from your kids? You have so many choices as a teacher now. With this, this is like a little cupboard full of ingredients. You could make so many different things from this. This could be 10 different 12 different conversation pieces. You could have them, everybody's number 10. Pick number 10 off your list. Or nine, nine or 10. Pick one of those two things and everybody turn to your neighbor and tell them what it is and why. You know, you could partner them up. You could do large group shares. You could have everybody write freely about it. You could do any number of things. You could have them trade and do persuasive things. Why you should eat that barley soup. You have to have the barley soup. 
is so good for you. <laughs> and it's free. We have it right here <laughs> to give away to you right now. <laughs> you could do a whole lot of things. Are you seeing other things you could do with this list that I haven't mentioned? Okay. If you read the part below this list, you'll see how it can break easily down into persuasive writing, informative writing, storytelling, narrative writing. Would one of you be willing to read that blurb from James Moffat from Teaching the Universe of Discourse for me? Here, will you? In interior dialogue, in interior dialogue, we have subjective, spontaneous, inchoate, beginnings of drama, which is happening, narrative, what happened, exposition, what happens, and argumentation, what may happen. As it bears on curriculum, that means that students would tap successively their inner streams of sensations, memories, and ideas as raw material for recordings, narrative reports, and essay of generalization and theory. Thank you. Well, um, I never thought of it like this until I read this piece in that book just about a year and a half ago and went, aha, this is one way we can switch from writing the personal narratives our kids are so used to to writing expository writing is just by switching the verb tense. Narratives, what happened, expository or informative writing, what happens, present tense, how is it, what is it, how does it work, what does it look like, what is it made from, how does this happen, how do you get there, where do you go to buy it, that's all information in its present tense. What should happen? What's going to happen if we don't do something? What you better never do again in the future, young lady, is future that's persuasive. Isn't that an easy and interesting way to just click the verb tenses and take any topic to be past, present, and future? My favorite literary device is personification. I'm a theater person. That's why. Because turning everything into something personal helps people get it to me. So if we could act it out or draw it on a cocktail napkin, it's doable. And for kids who are disengaged, which is every student I've ever taught, for the most part, even the ones that look really, really eager and come in with their homework, help them get engaged. They all need to have help. Even when they're willing, they love you enough to look engaged. To be engaged is something different. So to make it personal, let's just try this. Everybody hear your past tense and you say, what happened? All together. What happened? Personal narrative. Okay, or historical narrative, or fictional narrative. That's past tense, that's narrative. You guys be informative, and you all say, what happens? Ready? What happens? Again. What happens? Good. Really emphasize the S. Ready? What happens? And we would get a story about Mr. Salinas. What happens? And we would hear all about what Mr. Salinas does for his job. Now, you guys, what should happen? Ready? What should happen? Good. And that's the future, and that's persuasive. So let's try barley soup. What happened? Well, my sister brought me this, and then we get a story. What happened? And ready? What happened? All about barley soup? It's glutinous. <laughs> it's gelatinous. It's tan. <laughs> Here is all description, what it does, you don't want to know. And here? What should happen? I should eat it. <laughs> so do you hear how easy it would be to make that happen over and over through the day? Uh, mention any objects from a piece of literature or from a news story. Like that diamond ring on that piece we just read, which, by the way, was from The Onion. That was the piece that was a spoof on a story. It was from The Onion. It was from my Onion calendar. Not all of them are classroom appropriate, but they're all funny. And every once in a while, you get one that demonstrates something about writing like that one did. The need for things to be general. I recommend read The Onion regularly. You'll find things that your kids will love. On the back of your handout are some ways kids can um, get step-up help for what happens, what information, what is it made of, what does it cause. All of these things are good for info shots. We know about snapshots, description, and thought shots, what you were thinking at the time. 
info shots to embed information into something that we're writing. These are some um, clear ways kids can add those. Um, so pick out one of the two items that's either number seven or number eight. And then, once you've selected, write it over here, my topic on the other side of the page. Just copy it over, my topic. If you think of something else that's not on that list you'd rather write about, write that down. Something you wish somebody would buy for you. Your job is to write very short sentences with a capital and period. It's not a list, it's really sentences. And you say, for number one, I really want a blank. Just, I really want a, and finish that sentence. Number two, oh, you don't do it in the boxes. You go ahead and write it where it says one. Number two says, it has the most, or it would have the most. You might have needed to change that to they have the most if it was something that's a plural, like some M&Ms. <laughs> Number three, it or they also have. It also has. Number four, without it, I, and finish that sentence, without it or them, that's why. And number six, I only hope, I only hope, and finish that sentence. And what you've just written is a kernel essay. A kernel, like a kernel of corn essay. Those six sentences are going to hang together like a tiny little kernel that makes total sense, has a beginning, middle, and ending. It's got thought-to-thought -thought progression, and it's probably really fun to hear. So, do you see the bottom margin under PFD? Not the PFD box, but underneath there where there's a little loose margin. Down there, would you please write these three words? I heard this. I heard this. And then put one, two, three, so that you can collect three people's signatures. But if you need them to get three signatures that they heard this, it means they can't switch papers and read this. They need to hear it. Ears hear content. Eyes proofread. It took me about 22 years of teaching to realize that the writing process is associated with body parts. Eyes proofread. Did you hear some that were very different from yours? Did you hear any that were completely literal? Did anybody hear any that had a little metaphor in it that were things that you don't actually buy? I need somebody to buy me a heartbreak hotel. You know, something that's a... <laughs> maybe not that. Um, can we hear a few examples, just to hear some uh, examples and see what we would do with them in class? I've heard some wonderful things from you as I've walked around the room that we'd like to also share. Let's hear yours, and then let's hear yours. I really want a pair of red bottom shoes. They have the most beautiful soles I've ever seen. They also have many different styles of red bottom shoes. Without them, I'll be fine, but I would love to have a pair of red bottom shoes. <laughs> That's why I'm really hoping to have someone purchase a pair for me. I only hope that I won't have to buy a pair of red bottom shoes myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I really want an unlimited supply of plane tickets. It will have the most impact on my life. It also has a goal of endless possibilities, like 3,000 places to go before I die. Huh? Without it, I would be unfulfilled. That's why plane tickets can be <laughs> I only hope there's a bad job. <laughs> There. I really want my tennis shoes back. <laughs> they have the they have the most healing power to my feet. <laughs> you notice she wrote on different sticky notes, which leads us to a whole bunch of different next steps. Go ahead. Also have my three hundred dollar orthotics inside them. <laughs> Without 
them, I am going to suffer more, perhaps. You'll be her human microphone stand. That's why I may have to budget $300 plus 90 I only hope no one steals them from under my bed. I thought it would be fun to look at somebody else buying her a magic genie. Were you waking up and under your pillow is uh, what? Would you like it to be? Things you've lost? That one makes a really great one. Um, because usually an item that you lost, the reason that we miss them is because of what they represent. So that item that's lost is a perfect ready-made symbol or metaphor for something else. So if you have kids, think about one thing, some object they lost, and tell about that, and then they can do that reflective layer of, this isn't just about my grandmother's ring. This is not about jewelry. This is about memories, or this is about the bond I have with my family. Or This one man wrote about his table, said he's got to share his. So he shared his, and it was about his grandmother's rosary. He lost it on the way to Rome. Yeah, he was going to have the Pope bless that rosary. And it was lost on the way. And that was all he told, that he really was sorry that it was gone and about his grandmother. And then he finished his colonel essay, and the people at his table said, you got to tell that one detail. It wasn't part of his colonel, but in talking about it afterwards, you know how he lost it? Anyway, um, tell us that detail about how he lost the rosary. He was on that boat, the Concordia, that turned sideways. That's how it got lost. It wasn't that he was careless. Can you believe that? It was like, oh yeah, and that's how it happened. That was one, the one detail. Whoa, that was like that girl on top of a rock looking at a good view. It was amazing. <laughs> A little discussion before you make your choices or before you make a list is fine. And you can, you can ask them if you're doing it list-like, because I like a lot of order in my classroom. So everybody take your pencil, and now if you can think of anything that you ever lost when you were a little kid, write that down. If you can't think of it, just keep staring at the wall. Now, can you think of anything you lost today? Can you think of anything that you lost and you're sure you'll find it, it's in your room somewhere? Can you think of anything that you used to have inside you that's gone now? You know, so you can prompt them yourself and let them do a little mental conversation with just you. And then you can stop and say, can we have a few, does anybody want to share one thing from any part of that list? Well, that's where they start loosening up. If they hear, I lost a ring. I got it for my birthday, and I only wore it twice. <laughs> and then the other people will think about similar stuff. It oils up their, their brains. Yeah, me too, me too, me too. And that's where they really get going crazy. So, so I like to have them try it and then share what they got. Even if some of them came up empty, they learn from each other really well. The four levels there in the book Crunch Time, Cynthia Candler, who's a Dallas area teacher, she teaches seventh grade in Terrell ISD, and she's just like you guys, a brilliant innovator. And she showed me something that she did. I made her be a co-author with me on Crunch Time. Same with Jane Hover, who came here. Um, last time there was one of these. Le the th four levels. And it, these levels aren't score points. They're not grades. They're kinds of things you're going to write about. Is this something that's so general everybody has had it also? Or is this too private? It's a TMI kind of thing. And her idea is, once, everybody's been there and done that. Why write about it if it's, this morning I woke up and I was breathing. <laughs> air in, air out, over in. Uh-huh, you're waiting for something new or exciting or interesting, because that's not interesting. Um, two. These are things that not only, these are things everybody's experienced already. Six flags. Six flags, yeah. My birthday, I had a birthday, and then I had another one. <laughs> and then they started blurring together, and I don't know how old I am now. 
tattoos are things your family and friends know about you, but probably not everybody has done that, and probably not everybody knows that about you. Threes, only your very best friend knows this about you. And you're even thinking maybe you shouldn't have told them. And fours, not even your best friend knows this. It's some of your experience that you would not even let anybody ever know about. So Cynthia asked the kids to draw pictures, make a little picture in some kind of way showing what this is. And so this one girl went like this. This is a cliff. And here you are, way back there, far away from the cliff. Score point, or not score point, level two experiences. You're getting closer to the cliff. You can see over the edge, but you're still pretty safe. But you can see the danger. The threes, you are one toe on the edge. And it looks kind of precarious. Four, you are falling. <laughs> so which of these should you write about for school? School is its own situation. You're neither a priest nor a parent nor a confidant nor a confessor. But in some ways you are all of those. So where, how can we articulate where you and the classroom culture falls for something that's both interesting to be made clear? Well, this one would <laughs> level one experience. Nobody wants to read them. These ones Probably not, though I've read a few where I was shocked kids wrote that and everybody wanted to read them because they were riveting. Kind of like The Hunger Games is a book would, that would not have been written during my childhood, but the, the edge of the envelope keeps moving. Oprah Winfrey helped that, talking about abuse in a personal way. Kind of opened up for everybody how conversations should be happening. It shouldn't be such unspoken stuff. So the bar moved. So this, yeah, my teacher and I had sex last week. <laughs> Probably not. My friends and I bought some crack. Mm. Probably not. Um, I'm going to kill my friend. Probably not. Those could all be fictional. But probably, that's not, those are not really things that anybody would ever want to reveal. These would make good pieces of writing. Those would make good pieces. Though, anybody could try anything, but just knowing the levels, that is a very useful tool. Uh, this boy, this was a girl interpretation, and she made these stick figures a lot cuter than I did. One of Cynthia's students put it in terms of a, uh, a tree. This was a boy. Uh, here's a tree and a beehive. A tree and a beehive. And that doesn't move. So you know that's danger. So level one, very safe, is somebody standing way behind the tree. Level two, somebody's on this side of the tree. Level three, on this side of the tree, holding a stick. <laughs> <laughs> and level four, bees all around. <laughs> Let's talk some more about this kernel essay pattern. How many of you actually use these with your students and have something to tell about how they worked, what worked, and what did you do to tweak it? Anybody tell your stories? Um, so I used the expository kernel essay that we did last time. Which was, do you remember what it was? It was um, a truism, examining a truism, um, talking about the truism, where you saw it in the book. Oh, the 11 minute essay. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I did that with our English language learners for the start. What age group? Ninth, ninth grade? grade? And that worked really, really well. I kind of had to tweak it because the font that we used wasn't really a truism. It was more like a, it was, it was talk about time when, or, oh, 
Explain some concept. Like responsibility, what is courage? Okay. I have it. So I'll look it up. But I had to tweak it because it wasn't necessarily a truism. Uh -huh. But they had to talk about. Um, but they did use the structure of the book, the movie, and then the moment in history. Historical events, but we also did current events. And that, using a current event, mm -hmm. really, really helped them. Oh, good. So, and we talked about, you know, what can be a general trend of the news that you, that you know about. And a lot of them, um, this is only mm -hmm. their second year in the country, so a lot of them left Mexico because of the drug cartel. So they're very aware of current events. Right. That's so one thing our ESL students have that our native kids don't have is a lot of world knowledge. And they think that they don't know anything. But yeah. really they know about that, they know about the immigration situations. So there are a lot of things they can talk about and find connections to various prompts. So um, it was really great because I proctored some of them for the star and I could see their flow charts and then using their kernel essays. Oh, and that for them was such a great scaffold to have. And they really took the time to breathe. <laughs> well, who else has a favorite animated movie from recent times or your childhood? Fifth graders. They think they are not children anymore. So they went over and started adding titles. And we made a little box full of titles of favorite movies. And I, was, I thought, this is so smart. How can I be so smart? You know, some days it just happens this way. So then we started doing an 11-minute essay, and asked, can, we got to the movie connection. And I said, see if you can connect it to one of those in the box. And he went, how did you do that? <laughs> and I said to him, Disney, you know, movies, Disney movies are archetypal. They connect to everything. Or not just Disney, but any of the really good fairy tales and stories connect to everything. So how many of you weren't here last time and, or you want a refresher, you'd like to see that 11 minute essay again? You don't know what it was and you would like, like to? Because it's just sort of a magic thing. It is. Isn't it? Well, how about let's do one. Let's make it a seven minute essay. <laughs> we could shorten it so we could do it like a kernel essay and you, we could make it quicker. Would that be good? All right, let's do that. Things we do with stuff for our kids, especially cheap stuff. You know. Cheap stuff tricks in class. That would make another good article. Things we can do. Well, here we go. Let's do the 11 minute essay right quick and then I'm going to show you the paper bags. The 11 minute essay we're going to do in just a few minutes, not 11. Kids have more rules than grown ups. There's a truism. These are truisms. We call them truisms. They're technically one single sentence that is a third person, present tense, life lesson kind of sentence. Um, kids have more rules than grown-ups. Life's not fair, then you die. You know, those things that we know, things that we know that are true about the world. And they're all debatable and they're all oppositely true. They're all totally revisable. But here's one. Write it down if you think it's true. If you're a kid, you completely think it's true. Now that you're a grown up, you might have a different perspective. Either copy this as is if you think it's true or change it until you think it's true. Do you know what I mean? If you think it's true that adults have more rules than, grown than kids, write that. Or what do you think the truth is? Write that and then stop. Make your sentence. So you're going to start with a truism sentence. This is where we have a little text to read. With struggling readers of any kind, reading a photograph or a drawing or a piece of artwork is just as useful as reading word verbal text. What's happening in this picture? Kids and I talk about it. Can you see it? Someone's handing someone something. How do you identify the people? What do we know about those two people? Who are they? They have backpacks that tells you they probably are students. There's no one else there. So that gives you thinking. Uh, think, that gives you a thinking that they're in secret. That, that gives you the thought this is probably in secret. So okay, here's what the 11 minute essay does. You ready? Think, now that we've had a little thought about what this is, 
Let's go back to the sentence. Kids have more rules than grown-ups. You just wrote this down, or a sentence that's similar to it. Right after you put the period, continue writing, and your question is for the next one minute, can you just explain what that means? Don't give examples, just explain what do those words mean? Which kids? What grown-ups? What rules? Can you explain your terms? You have one minute flat. Ready, go. Stop. Take a breath and stretch your fingers. And for the next two minutes, think about that sentence that you wrote, the first sentence. And think about any moment in a story that you've read that shows how true that is. Think about all the books you've ever read, all the stories you've ever read, until you hit one moment in one story where that was true. Tell what was the book and what was the moment that showed how true that was. You have two minutes. Time's up. And now, look back at that sentence you started with and now think about movies. Think about the movies in the box we just put on our whiteboard. Put some boots, Shrek, or any movies you've ever seen of any kind, and think about one moment in a movie that shows how true that sentence is. When you get one, start a new paragraph and say, in, in the name of the movie, and tell how true the sentence is. You have two minutes. Think about how much history you've learned in your whole life. History of Texas, history of other states, history of our whole country, American history, how we started, history of the world, ancient civilizations, other countries, recent history in other countries, recent current events, any history you've ever learned. Think back until you think of one moment that shows how true that was. Tell that moment in history and comment on that for two minutes. If you can't think of a moment in history, just keep looking at the picture. And now there's only one more step. The step is take a breath, stretch your fingers out, make a new paragraph, and you have one minute to write down something that your whole conversation leaves you wondering. What does it make you wonder about in your own life? Start your paragraph with, I wonder, and you have one minute. Say something that makes you wonder and explain what you mean. Time's up. At this point, I ask my students to give it a um, title. Don't call it 11-minute essay, which they all do the first time. But name it something that it really means, something that what you said. Pull out something and use that as your title. Even you adults. Kind of had to stretch mentally to connect that thought to that form, that media, medium. And kids at first sometimes can't do it very well at all until they practice and hear each other's a little bit. They get three signatures, just the same way you just did. And they all start making easier and easier connections. Did you recognize the SAT type prompt? It has now become the star type prompt. Here's a thought, right? Um, story or an explanation or a position. The three of your groups could relate to that sentence. What happened, how this works, what I think is true and I'll explain how it works, or what I think should be changed about it. We can use this structure for any of those three types of writing as a beginning. So these don't make necessarily finished essays as they are. They were five little brainstorming things, which I really like to have them do each different part on a different index card. And then tape them, rearrange them however you think you'd like to use them, throw out any weak ones, put them, or like your sticky notes, then put them on, well, either a piece of newsprint or more likely a book cover that's in one of those boxes full of book covers that are stacked up in the book room. If you're lucky, they're only printed on one side and the other side is blank. We use those as free school supplies for a million purposes. 
But lay out what you're going to write, already written on your index cards there, and write what bridges one thought to the next. Those bridge thoughts are missing. That's why this is a perfect pre-transition lesson, because there is a screaming need for transitions. Not only is this true in kids' lives, it's true in, you know, the underwater world, you know, or whatever transition <laughs> would lead from one to the next. Here's an example of one written by one of my students just, when was this? Yesterday? Uh-huh. Philip Kaplan, kids have more rules than grown-ups. Kids have more rules than grown-ups because grown-ups make the rules. <laughs> He's got a point. Mm, grown-ups can decide where their limits are. Kids get their limits and rules decided for them by grown-ups. In the book, Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card, Ender has all these rules made for him by the battle school. All the kids are like toys for the adults. The adults make the rules. I would consider the adults in the book to be hypocrites. They don't need to follow the rules. They make them. These kids, by getting this experience over and over, several of these in a row, internalize the process. That doesn't mean they need to use exactly this process whenever they start writing, but they've got it under their belt as tools. When they see a truism, they can talk about it, and they're used to reaching around for resources, not just in their lives, but in all the things they've seen to use to help make their points. And that's the text evidence that we want them so desperately to use. Anyway, we're out of time. I can't show you anymore. Let's look at the ending. I wonder why children have more rules than adults. Is it because adults are adults? Adults make the rules. They don't necessarily have to follow them. So yesterday I put up that one truism, the one about kids and rules, the picture of the kids in the stairwell. But I said, everybody use this one. Or, draw one out of the bag or your own personal truism. And this bag is full of little tiny thumbnail photos with sentences. For instance, what does yours say? Can you read it? It's so little. Young people love to be asked for advice. Young people love to be asked for advice. Do you think that's true? Yeah, I do. When kids really need to help you, I mean, when you need their help and it's true, you're not just making it up, that's when some bonding can happen. You get a kid in detention, and you're desperately needing to fix your sharpener, and they work on it. You've got a relationship. People must have hunts of one kind or another. That's a father and a daughter looking for CDs. Shopping is our modern day kind of hunting. Look what I got. I bagged one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what these are. They're printed tiny. And there are a whole bunch of them. As we get ready to close out this session, and let's give Ms. Benavidez our gratitude. Oh, thank you, thank you.